where I'm coming from is uh, I remember I heard, I was listening to a podcast, Douglas Rushkoff's Team England podcast, and this question really stuck out, uh, stood out to me. How are we going to communicate about the problem if the very nature of the problem is a failure of our communications media? Um, and I'll, I've decontextualized this question. They were talking about it in the context of uh, the loss of human attributes that happen in face-to-face -face communication. So uh, biological rhythms and uh, you know, uh, eye, like, uh, connecting people through the eyes and things like that. But it was just a profound question that stuck with me for a very long time. I continue to see this play out. And so during my time at SFI, you know, I, there's not many lenses that I sort of wear. So I look at the world of communication and complexity through multiple lenses. I worked at, the, at an advertising agency uh, you know, really focused on communications, of course, going to SFI, um, learning about systems and design and foresight, as well as the Canadian and as a second generation, as like a second generation Canadian, I always had this kind of multi-perspective lens that I would just have to wear when I navigated the world. That was just a natural part of who I was. So these are all the different lenses that I brought to this topic. And when I was, I even remember key instances, I noticed the way we talk about the complex issues doesn't always reflect the complexity of the issue. So I remember going to a basic income guarantee kind of uh, conference at U of T and Ryerson that they put on. Um, and it was great and it's informative, but there's always this sense of dualism when they set up like who's speaking on stage, like they'll have like person A speak, person B, different vantage points but you don't actually get to get to get into the richness of like understanding the context behind each. And um, similarly, I remember there was like the tax reform issues that the Liberal government had. You have TVO, TVO which if you're on the SFI news groups, you'll know that I'm a huge fan because I'm always like, here's a documentary, here's a session. But uh, they'll always have the talking heads, right? And you can only go so far. Uh, block sidewalk became a huge topic with the sidewalk labs. I felt like that was a complex topic that really got reduced to who could channel a communication strategy the best rather than the nuances about governance and uh, relationships between uh, high tech and smart cities and urban infrastructure. Um, I remember the 12 years term that came up from the UN, you know, like there was a large report, the context of the report, whether it was contained or in it based on different publications, at the end of the day, it was always like 12 years. Um, and, and so on with some, you know, as a, as a cyclist in Toronto, there was a lot of discussion happening. Uh, Ontario Line and Metrolinx, there's always topics about, you know, transit itself are always topics that bring up this question about how we talk about complex issues. So the point that I'm trying to make here is a, a more of a personal experience is I was looking at a lot of issues that are local to me um, that I saw that there was this mismatch between the communication of the issue and the complexity contained within it. Um, and that, that came to a head, I really like this headline, that came to a head with the Wasubitan uh, issue early this year, that literally the media could not represent the issue effectively, and I think that that actually became quite well known. Um, just a sidebar here, this reminds me of one caveat, this is a pre-COVID MRP, <laughs> so you won't see uh, too many references to that, but by all means, or you will see the progress that it makes into uh, the COVID era, you could say. So this is a pre-COVID, uh, you'll see March 10 was kind of my cutoff. Um, so, so I'm taking all those perspectives into my research question when I had the opportunity to do MRP at OCAD. Um, and I basically came up with this question about how might systemic design shift the practice of, of strategic communication so organizations can reflect and respond to the real world complexity of their issues and stakeholders. Um, somewhat of a mouthful, but not, not, um, not unfamiliar for, for the OCAD MRP. And what I'm gonna do is I'll break this down a little bit. I'll, let, I'll deconstruct this uh, slightly. Um, there's a visualization that I'm just putting together, even thinking about strategic communication as the practice, and that is looked at through the lens, you could say, of systemic design. And that is meant to, you know, assist or help organizations here respond to um, what I'm kind of visualizing here as a complex issue and their stakeholders and all the variety contained within it. So systemic design is a big anchoring point in this uh, research question. So I just want to slightly touch on that in case audiences aren't uh, super familiar with that field. Um, 
when it comes to complex issues, a lot of the traditional methods are ineffective or worse, could even be harmful. And so the number of the issues that I referred to earlier and the ones that dominate our narratives and communications are wicked in nature. That, that is in the wicked problem sense. So they are by their very definition unsolvable. Um, and yet there are traditional design methods that take a problem solution orientation are oftentimes attempted to be placed onto these issues. And so the context of design traditionally, you know, quotes around the 1.0, 2.0 that Peter and Van Patter had assembled. Um, but here we're starting to recognize the 3.0 and 4.0 level where you're working with complex problems um, and wicked problems with a, a range of kind of a stakeholder variety and issues that are uncontrollable. So when you're working down here towards maybe a commercial or market purpose orientation, you're actually affected by the higher order kind of um, elements that are happening. And so there was a need for design to move further up the chain to be able to address these types of issues. Um, and so enter systemic design. And systemic design actually integrates the mindsets and tool sets of system thinking and design uh, thinking to understand and intervene in complex situations. So um, this I found was a really nice and inclusive definition of what system systemic design is. And it, it's basically the integration of both. Um, and as a field, so it, it's actually emerged as a field, it, it has built up legitimacy and practical value in addressing complex social issues. So OCAD um, and out of uh, Oslo and Norway, we produce giga maps or synthesis maps, uh, which are kind of workshops or ways of assembling groups of people around a representation of a complex issue. This is not meant to be something that is definitive, rather it's an interface that you use to make sense of a, of a of the non-linear multi-perspective kind of issue. And these are published in different um, mediums and Gary Metcalf's on the call. Yay. Um, as well as, you know, toolkits, um, RSD conferences, an association, different schools across, across, the, across the globe, really. Uh, this year, uh, National Institute of Design in India is going to be hosting the RSD uh, symposium next month. And there's even uh, consultancies that, you know, specialize in systemic design, like uh, out, of, out of Norway, uh, Alberta Collab is another one, uh, Mars Solution Lab, there's a number of them. So the, but there's an opportunity for the field to actually improve how it communicates complexity to broader audiences. And what I mean by that are actually taking this knowledge and going beyond the walls of the client's workshops or symposium settings and into media formats that are maybe more meaningful, maybe more salient towards actually driving public attitude shifts and behavior change. So uh, these are some of our peers uh, kind of sharing their uh, posters uh, and a lot of dialogue that happens in, in, a, in a symposium setting. So my, my interest is kind of take that outside of those walls. Um, and that's where commu strategic communication kind of comes in. So one of the go-to definitions is that strategic communication is the purposeful use of communication by an organization to fulfill its mission. So it really is that. It really is using communication to achieve your objective. Uh, and organizations use it across the board, governments, nonprofits, private, all types of different sectors. Um, my interest is actually in the form of strategic communications practiced by the ad industry, because it actually shows how organizations are trying to respond to complex social issues. Um, and my, my ad is that like it has a commercial orientation. So we've seen in recent years a lot of big, big campaigns that really go at uh, you know, societal kind of issues, whether it is systemic racism or toxic masculinity or um, equal, equal opportunity uh, for the women in the workplace. Uh, there's all, these all find their way into the large, you know, the large brand communications. And I found that to be a really interesting turn that um, kind of advertising was taking. And so for me, that stood out as an appropriate practice because I have a background in that as well, as I mentioned to explore how to communicate complexity with broader audiences. So I won't go through this, but I've actually assembled a little a framework of just, uh, you know, based off of a lot of the industry, uh, IPA account planning groups, uh, WARC, which is an industry uh, tool, to assemble, you know, essentially a, a 
process by which strategic communication can occur, but I myself recognize it's not a process definitively. This is just a framework I put together for the purposes of orienting audiences um, during my, during my uh, research. So it goes from establishing the context, setting objectives, doing the research, crafting the message, and all that. Um, for time's sake, I won't go deeply into it, but I'll cover the select stages in the case study. So just coming back to the research question, it's kind of those attributes. It's like how might systemic design shift the practices of strategic communication so organizations can reflect and respond to the real world complexity of their issues and stakeholders. Um, and systemic design, like I mentioned, plays a key role here because it is kind of how it re will reveal this new understanding about the practice. And these elements like the organization, the arena, and all those are key parts of systemic design as a methodology. Um, and so I'll, I'll quickly, I'll try to quickly cover off the case, the setup of the case study um, about what I looked into. So that's the research question I wanted to explore and I wanted to apply that in a real way. So I chose an arena uh, that is the complex issues facing Canadian news media and its stakeholders. Um, and when I refer to arena, I actually mean the, the area by which st uh, stakeholders who share a common concern kind of use, you know, they, they, they have dialogue, they have exchanges or ways about understanding their issues. So there's just some references to industry publications that talk about policy for the uh, digital age. Um, I mean, the public policy forum, Shattered Mirror, this was a huge one in 2017. that made a lot of waves. Um, uh, you know, the Atkinson Foundation, which has a history uh, associated with the Toronto Star, been working in that space, McConnell Foundation is looking at public interest journalism. And you have organizations that actually continuously, so these are all three of these are ongoing projects that observe uh, the arena, for lack of a better word. So that's kind of the, 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 the subject area that I looked at is this uh, Canadian news media. Um, and some of these examples uh, are like the declining ad revenue, closure of local newsrooms, changing media habits, spread of misinformation, erosion of democratic and civic functions, regulatory, issues and there's many more but these are just a, a sample of issues that you can see come from these reports in the intersection of them um, and there is some previous systemic design work that uh, kind of echoes these complex issues uh, David Akramanis who's going to be presenting next he, his group did some work on media and meaning uh, Mazi Javidiani, uh, a graduate from 2018, did one on this very subject about the uh, trust in journalism. Um, and some of our, uh, I would say, associates <laughs> in, the, on, in the US side had a chaplain, Kayla Christofferson, present at RSD at the Systemic Design uh, uh, Symposium, and they've shared, uh, they've done some work on systems uh, journalism. So uh, I have the arena, and then it was about selecting an organization. So the organi organization is Independent Media Association of Canada, um, and they truly have skin in the game when it comes to those issues facing the landscape. So um, they're an organization that is made up of a coalition, you could say, of different independent Canadian news media outlets. Um, and their, you know, their mission is to support the growth of a more sustainable and diverse media ecosystem. They look at funding, they look at representation, they look at innovation, there's kind of three uh, objectives. Um, I forgot to add in my asterisks at the time of um, my research, they, this, they were named this, it was a loosely held association, they've since rebranded, they're now called Press Forward, and I think some of their membership has changed, but I just want to be transparent with that caveat um, as I go through the project. So I got the arena, I got the organization. Um, and then it came, when it comes to the practice, this is where I actually integrated the systemic design principles. Uh, these are principles that uh, Peter Jones had kind of assembled together based on longstanding systems and design um, kind of histories of, of shared principles and common approaches that are applicable to both fields. And so he kind of has a well-documented synthesis of these principles. And I kind of map those to the relevant stages of the communication process that I that I kind of embarked on. Um, I am going to do a grand disservice to the principles by only briefly describing them this way. Please you know, note that there are expanded um, uh, descriptions, but uh, these seven principles were most relevant, uh, the ones here I showed up to here. Um, and so 
uh, idealization, uh, appreciating complexity, purpose finding, boundary framing, requisite variety, feedback coordination, and system ordering. Um, these draw upon works if there are systems folks in this audience from Akoff to Richard Buchanan to um, Ashby. Um, there's a variety of names and ideas that are kind of distilled in here. Um, for the purposes of times, I won't go through them in each one, but I will come back to these in the form of my findings. So uh, I'll, I'll definitely touch on those. Not only that, there was actually certain methods that uh, Peter had also assembled that matched to the principles, and some of them uh, bolded here are ones that I used throughout my, my research. Okay, so I know that that was a lot of setup. <laughs> and I, I kind of feel bad that it's that much, but it's actually important to establish all that. So I think now we can see that I'll adapt the research question to the case study. So it's how might a systemic design approach to strategic communication help IMAC uh, reflect and respond to the complexity facing Canadian news media and its stakeholders. So just an adaptation of the, I'm working at two levels, the project level and the case study level. So finally, the case study. These are the ones that I was able to do within the scope of my research. I wasn't able to go all the way towards producing like a mass thing. It's more, it's more about a strategic concept for now, which lives around this area. So I'll go through each phase and I'll just briefly touch on what I learned. So when it came to the context and objectives, um, I found that a systems-oriented approach really considered the higher order system instead of the immediate environment. And so, you know, I looked at, um, you know, looking at the landscape of what was happening in journalism in Canada, there was this big issue around the government funding and subsidy of news media at the time that I was studying it. Um, and you saw a lot of kind of columns, opinion pieces, reports about the different perspectives, um, whether it was freelancers or independent organizations about you know, the issues that they took with the support um, or, the, or people who are echoing support for it. You know? So they kind of show when we go to a higher level of rather than just having uh, IMAC look at who are our friends or allies and what are they feeling, when you go to the broader system, you actually start to see a bigger variety uh, in, in multiple perspectives about a topic. And so um, that, and this is where I kind of lead into, you know, their, their own strategic objective was to increase the number of collaborative research and development projects towards in, uh, innovation. So when it came to objective setting, uh, I really thought to do about, well, increasing stakeholders' willingness to collaborate in the first place is what will get you the appetite for um, innovation, collaborative innovation projects. And so that can only happen when you look at how the stakeholders are feeling currently about the landscape and their willingness or unwillingness to collaborate on media projects. Then I moved into the stage where you kind of look at audiences, you know, you might, you might select your user audiences and things like that. Uh, at this stage, it, you're actually choosing audiences that try to represent the variety of the system, not like a narrow ideal audience. So in a commercial setting, you might say the perfect, the perfect user for my product is X. Um, but in a systems oriented approach, you're actually trying to say, how can I represent the variety of uh, the, the, the stakeholders in the system? And so we develop, I developed, you know, kind of different stakeholder groups um, that are that I extracted from my scan, uh, basically, and I worked with a secondary advisor as well uh, to identify these different stakeholder groups. And the idea would be to understand how each of them sees the Canadian news media landscape how they perceive it, what boundaries they draw, et cetera. So it definitely widens kind of the audience, uh, the way you go about uh, identifying audiences. Then it came time for research. So the research was interesting. It actually, I found myself focusing more, placing more emphasis on the relationship that stakeholders have to the issue space and other stakeholders, rather than just looking at the, the stakeholder, like their individual attributes or characteristics. So think of uh, when you look at like a node in a, in a web, uh, it was actually the line, the, the connection between the nodes that I was looking at, not necessarily the, per, the, the attributes or characteristics of the node itself. So I did, um, I actually did 25 semi-structured interviews. Uh, these are one-to-one -one discussions across a number of um, these stakeholder groups. Um, and, and then I started to synthesize all those together. So rather than having it, um, oh, sorry. Uh, so one of the main research findings was that 
it was a pathway to transitions that are contested, not the current state or desired future state. So here I lit, these all came from the dialogue that I had all independently. These all were all identified about the current situation uh, that we see in, in the Canadian news media. And I'll jump over here to say the desired future. Um, so you have smaller new rooms, layoffs, loss of advertising, as mentioned. We want you know, balanced perspective, critical information, sustainable models, et cetera. But it was really this, this middle column that was contested, the pathways about what does the government do? You know, what is our relationship with tech? How do we create the right types of business models? The role of CDC as, as a public broadcaster, it plays a critical role. You know, how, do we, how do we manage that together? These were all kind of contested because different stakeholders had different views about the way forward. And rather than leave that in the abstract, I'll actually show you that. I'll show you what I looked at just as one example. So here you could say the baseline was about uh, describing the government's relationship with news media. By no means, by the way, is this accurate? This is a symbolic representation of how different audiences view um, these issues. So, the news media will produce journalistic content, informs the public, public stays engaged with the government, and they also happen to be the ones who check the government, the revenue comes. Uh, but there's a lot of broader market dynamics at play that are putting pressure on. Okay, so if that's the baseline, one group of audiences are gonna say, well, the government should or could directly support Canadian news media. So they provide the funds to the Canadian news media that gives them the resources they need to produce the content, the public stays better informed, um, and kind of there's, there's you know, that, that occurs. It does jeopardize kind of the check and balance, which some people brought up about if journalistic content is meant to check the government, how is this relationship working? Um, and so that, that kind of became contested. Another group will say, well, rather than intervene directly, why don't you actually regulate the market? And that might look like, you know, regulation around the tech platforms or things like that, things that are putting negative pressure on the news and media to, in order to reduce the pressure so that they can better provide the content, et cetera. Another view, a third viewpoint might be one that says, why don't we support the media ecosystem, which is like all the other actors that are within uh, media um, so that there's no government bias or preference to who it's funding or how it's getting involved, et cetera and the journalistic content can actually improve from an ecosystem approach um, and, and keep our public better informed and engaged with the government. I'm not here to provide the solutions, sorry to, sorry to burst that, I'm just kind of depicting the, the complexity found within it. So you look at it and it's like government intervention is contested based on the stakeholders' point of view. The different stakeholders, they draw different boundaries, they all have different experiences, they see cause and effect from different perspectives, um, and this systems oriented approach is one that tries to sit with all that and tries to reconcile that uh, in a way that doesn't reduce any of the quality of what's going on. So that's just an example of the research findings. I did that for the four other themes I talked about as well, but I'll, I'll just leave it at this stage for now. Okay. Now, is that about eight minutes now? Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. So. The strategy then is that, that, I de that I developed was one that actually tries to reflect the variety found in the system rather than reducing it to a single narrow pathway. Um, and so the messaging worked at two different levels, the system level and the issue level uh, across the four issues that I described. Um, and what I did was I assembled a structure that would describe that for this issue, here's the potential message and here's the context that we would try to recognize. And I actually tested that on some of the iMac associates, um, just as using that as message kind of stimulus, which, would, which does happen in strategic communication process. Um, one of the examples was, again, the government support. So I said, for this issue, what, what, if we encourage the government to support the conditions of innovation while recognizing all this context, so when I say context, I mean all this messiness, um, you know, what, what would you think of that message? And some of them were like, it may not be convincing enough to incite alternative views. It would need real examples. It might appeal to more smaller digital players. So this was all really valuable feedback. But overall structure, I actually, you know, brought it up to that system level and said, you know, for the overall issue, but the contested transition, if we were to work toward, work together towards a healthier state, 
given these contexts about the government tech sustainable business model and CDC, what would, you know, how would that structure work for you? And this is where I found a lot of value. They said that it actually has potential for audiences to appreciate the complexity of the media ecosystem. Um, they actually said it could create safer spaces for much needed conversation to happen. Um, and even they said sometimes it's great, but it might be too idealistic because in practice, the stakeholders don't really operate with the whole system of view in mind, which is actually a good learning for me to take because it's like this would encourage them to do so. So I'll, um, I'll jump to the learnings uh, real quick, which is the proposal of this idea about systems communication. So the evolved practice is uh, kind of branding it, so to speak, as systems communications to respond to complexity. Um, and the principles were embedded throughout systems communications. Um, the, ideal, the idealization allows for the ongoing discovery of alternative futures. Um, you appreciate complexity because no single person has a full understanding. There were different frames you saw um, uh, and boundaries that were defined. Uh, there was an attempt to represent them. Um, some of the feedback coordination that happened in the message uh, testing as well as the ordering as a hierarchy. So all these principles were kind of expressed in this uh, idea of the structure, messaging structure. Um, the main, this is probably the main thing I want to focus on is the difference between strategic communication and systems communication. So at the different stages, um, concept, in context and objectives, you're working at the higher order system. Uh, when it comes to the audiences, you're looking at the variety. You're trying to capture the system variety, sorry. Uh, research is less isolated and audience centric, it's more relationship centric. Um, strategy is a singular pathway versus here you're actually trying to enable multiple pathways that can emerge. Um, and the messaging is reductive or closed. It's actually in strategic communication, it's better when it's reductive and closed. And here I'm trying to say that actually being reflective of the complexity, multi sided, uh, inviting and open is, is beneficial and more, more representative of the reality. Uh, so to tie into that very uh, idea at the top, it was about systems communication might be a way to humbly invite people to create a shared understanding of a complex issue. So rather than, this is a funny takeaway, I thought about it as rather than having it be all these technical aspects, um, what this says to me is that maybe, maybe just having a more, a shift in the attitude or a tone towards being more humble in your approach when you're faced with complexity is the pathway to a systems communication. So this could actually lead you to crafting maybe creative provocations that recognize the limits of your understanding, um, deeply considers other perspectives, and invites um, collective sense making. Peter, can I finish the last two slides in one minute? Oh, I've got about three minutes, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we can, and you can, you could take up to five if you needed to, but yeah. You know, okay. Uh, no and start, yeah, start thinking of questions, folks. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've got a couple. Sure. Um, this idea of system communication leads to a couple of possibilities. Uh, one is, and I won't go through this, it, I totally admit this is just the first crack at imagining what it could be. There's all this work that needs to be done to flesh out um, the full stages of it. So I only got up to messaging and even the stages that I completed can benefit from all of these lenses to look at it. Um, but even, even one that stands out to me is like a sense sharing model that uh, Berger has uh, out of Norway. He's part of the systemic design community. This one really stood out to me as kind of a next stage of my research that I like to maybe look at. Um, Maybe sense sharing is a way to invite the creative concept development process, which is typically done through a brief towards the system-oriented outcomes. So here you're sharing the sense of the field and the hierarchy and the degree of complexity. So trying to imagine artifacts that actually can convey this is a really, that's a really fun challenge to me. And so that's something I look forward to. Um, Birger talks about rich design spaces. So you can see someone kind of immersed in a land of a wall of sticky notes, et cetera. Um, the other aspect is that there's actually an opportunity to look at it to how different organizations can benefit from systems communication. So when I think about organizations that are dealing with complexity, I do think about research and academia, especially as they move towards more inter and transdisciplinary approaches, they will need to communicate their findings or knowledge work um, in a variety of mediums. Governments, no doubt, I, I don't think I need to 
provide any examples towards that are always wrestling with the complex issues. Uh, you see think tanks becoming think and do tanks and starting to do more with engaging with richer means of communications. Uh, innovation labs, no doubt, in the social innovation sector um, are in this space, as well as philanthropic organizations. So this is a really rich area to look at, you know, different, different entities. Um, one of the ones that stood out the most is I really encourage you to check out Stephanie Fielding's um, Close Encounters of the Creative Kind. She produced this uh, kind of booklet at Brookfield Institute. Um, and she assembled a great uh, array of different kind of like policy uh, communications that are done in the arts through arts-based practices. So like audiovisual storytelling, long form, interactive installations. I had been doing my own collection of looking at like exhibit designs, um, simulation, like video game simulations, like even Vox when you start to look at how the way the narrative, you know, um, explainer journalism kind of comes up. There's something happening, and I'm admitting that I don't have it fully there, but there's something happening with how organizations are trying to communicate complexity in a richer way. And um, I think this is really interesting and exciting, and I think this is where the expression of systems communications can go. Um, and the second last thing is just there's different lenses. So I use systemic design as one lens. There's a number of other lenses. You can look at it through the media ecology, affordances and attention, uh, knowledge translation, which I talked about on the earlier slide. Narrative complexity is like how the narr narratology and complexity mix together. And if we only had someone talking about the brand and DSM, I think that'd be a great complement to that, which uh, David will talk about next. Um, the very, very last thing, I, I know I kind of went, went on a little extra, but um, uh, you know, before I reveal it, having gone through a design program, um, I started to look at my own approach to what I was describing earlier about problem solution orientation. And I started to see that design does have this predisposition towards action. And I really started to wonder about the value of inaction. Uh, and so kind of an abstract visual, I start to think about the intention to, ch to change as kind of this design-based viewpoint. And the other part that I really caught my attention was attention to what is changing. And that's a little bit more you know, towards nature, understanding the unfolding aspects of nature. Um, and from that thought process, I kind of realized like, you know, there's, there's learnings you get from design and there's a sense of humbleness that you get from appreciating nature. And perhaps these two are what can reconcile this, um, this separation between design as uh, forcing change and, and, and kind of nature as unfolding change. And so a bit of a meta, meta takeaway, but it kind of brings together the whole package of why I titled this um, Responding to Complexity with New York. Um, thank you to Peter and my secondary advisor, David Ng, as well, and Francesca for some of the graphics. I draw stick figures, I'm not very good. Um, I have a design-friendly version of this coming soon, so maybe just check me out on Twitter or don't, whatever. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Zen. Um, let's open it up for, for some questions for uh, discussion. and. Um, Let's see, I, I posted an introduction, introductory question in the chat, but let me open it up to somebody who would just like to throw a question out there right now, if you have one right now, I'll just leave the space for uh, open for any questions. Okay. Waiting for mine here, let's see. I, um, in the chat, um, uh, I know you had one example of kind of where st um, strategic communications from a systemic lens could start to go, taking perhaps a more process view in some ways. We actually, we have at least one uh, process philosophy uh, systems thinker on the call, Kirk Weigand, who's, who's kind of a Whitehead scholar. And in a way, there's, there's a way in which your communications approach is also very process oriented, especially in the framing of learning and humility as aspects of, of uh, dispositions towards, you know, the, the principles. So not just the principles and entailing those principles, but this dispositional way of, of working through communications as a process. And, uh, and 
So my, my question would be, have you seen other examples of more humble communication positioning around uh, significant complex topics? Um, any ads or styles that, that have kind of softer edges open up, open up a, a realm for questioning or, or ask? Yeah, you know, ask the the you know the reader to really consider that. I haven't seen anything in COVID that asks you to, you know, uh, question or learn. It's all about doing what to do. Right. Yeah, one of one of the ones that stood out to me. It was a thumbnail in the example, but I'll expand on it. Was uh, Ellen Alberta, the systemic design group there at the Alberta Collab. They did one on the opioid crisis, and they tried to put a face to the opioids to look at it from who it affects from a number of different views. So they had like a, almost like a gymnasium and you would walk through different paths that tells the story of different opioid users and how they fell into their addiction. And so the idea was to get the audience to truly immerse themselves outside of this point of view that um, the person is to blame or the person has an addiction problem and really have them walk through the, the journey of different lives that are affected by opioids. And I thought that was a really cool kind of way of doing that. Um, and I would generally say museum-like experiences often tend to do this. So if there are communications or advertising that's surrounded by exhibit design, simulations, um, installations, they, they tend to lean towards that, which is why I think the arts-based practice is what I personally see as kind of like reverse engineering the systems comms from the arts-based practices, right? Like you can actually maybe connect the dots of where my work is going and what the output is when it comes to artistic expressions. Okay, anybody else? Do you want them in the chat, Peter? Oh, or you can just ask, yeah, at this point. Okay. Um, you can put it in the chat if you want to nice. persist. Nice, nice job, Zach. Um, my, my question is just about the kind of the context, I guess, of social media. And I don't know how much that's affecting the context that, of the organizations that you're talking about or working with, but <clears throat> it just seems like the, the common denominator is becoming so low yeah. in terms of, it, I mean, in the U.S., where it's kind of get naked and scream loudly. Anything that gets attention is good. And when you're trying to communicate about anything that's complex, you know, it just, it seems to be running really against that stream. Mm -hmm. So I, is that an issue and how, how do you think about it? How are you trying to balance? Yeah, I, I, I uh, to be blunt, yes. <laughs> I, think, I think it's definitely an issue. What I think it's done is I think it's reduced the, the literal and metaphorical size of the frame through which you understand a complex issue. Um, so much of the optimization that other students have studied uh, around some of, even in our program of some of the social media, because they're optimized towards clicks or attention or time or whatever, they really are, it's, it's not in their interest to share nuance or multiple sides with you, which I find really bizarre coming at it from a systems oriented perspective. And so, yeah, I see it as a significant issue. And I know, you know, Peter might be able to jump in there. Peter has been looking at the media uh, and journalism approach as overall so even journalism's own window once you have ownership that is maybe more from a smaller group and they are focused on issues or uh, they're incentivized by objectives that are not the content that challenges the existing frame they also reduce it so it's like it's like it's playing out in our digital space and then it's playing out in the walls of our uh, communication arenas so i do see it as a as a significant problem um, or I can't say the word problem anymore, by the way. I see it as a significant concern. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Good say. Thank you. Yeah, actually, that is kind of a humble approach to also deproblematize so that you have to rethink what it is we're describing when we use the word, when we, when we consider that something is problematic. Who's saying that? You know, who are the, how's that system of problems constructed that we and, and and so it starts to turn it back into an inquiry into a humble approach another question i might have um for you is that is how you might could you consider how um your developing approach might be used as an alternative to nudge communications which have been really all the rage you know for the last 
five years or so, um, building on Cass Sunstein's um, right. approach to behavior change through communica strategic communications, or at least creating a surround, which is almost like the, the pure definition of propaganda, which is right. a multi-sided surround of consistent communication that reinforces particular preferred behaviors. Mm -hmm. And you're in some ways, which I really love, uh, proposing the opposite of that, allowing people to think for themselves and to make, make better decisions right. perhaps, but yeah. at least is the way I, I start to see it. Yeah. An anti-nudge. For sure. I, I think that comes up as an example of, let's say uh, you are really holding to, to the principle of requisite variety or, or trying to represent the variety, then maybe as the strategic planner of an initiative, you actually might question what your clients are predisposed to as a, as a bias for who you're selecting and maybe your research or the type of audience. And you, and, and by taking a systems oriented perspective, you would want to immerse yourself in the unfinished variety. So the, the unsolvable kind of variety that sits in a, in a, in a complex issue. Um, one of the journal, one of the journalists from the American side uh, that I, I kind of stole the, uh, borrowed the strategy idea was about complicating the narrative. So what narratives are out there um, what, when you're doing your research or you're doing your audience analysis and what are the dominant narrative frames and how do you complicate that? What would introduce a, a severe complication to your work that you would actually in this approach welcome? So uh, I agree with you. It does flip the script on the traditional process and I see if you truly embody it, it could potentially help you appreciate uh, the richness that's out there um, versus versus a reductive approach. Okay, thanks. Um, anybody else? So, uh, I have time for for one more question. Okay. Anybody from um, from SFI who's interested in this uh, topic themselves in terms of you know, the actual focus area or communications or journalism. Uh, Dan Ng here. Um, actually, I wanted to ask that and probably Gary has a good feedback in yourself, Peter. I mean, where is this going to start? Where are we going to try to plant this seed in this whole notion of expansive thinking, this whole notion that we should be humble in our you know, we should have humility. Where do we plant that? Where does that start? Yeah, this is, oh, that's a very, very good question, Dan. And this is one I've been only recently starting to wrestle with. Uh, again, um, unsurprisingly, it's a counterintuitive area. Uh, it's counterintuitive reasoning, which is I think it starts by intentionally narrowing the boundary of the media and the, and the information that you kind of swim in. Um, because what happens is that, and this is my own personal opinion, by no means is this the objective reason, but um, if you kind of bound yourself to um, a certain uh, region or a certain area, then you won't be so easily influenced by every piece of new stimulus that tries to push you off your feet through emotions or other cues. And I think by, ba by bounding yourself, not not in the, in the reduction of frames, but by bounding yourselves in types of the type of reasoning uh, that you look at, then you might be able to kind of um, start to appreciate how complex a, a, an issue is that's related to you, that you have, that you have skin in the game in, that you have um, a shared risk with in terms of the outcomes. And I think oftentimes it might be easy to get, some, to get upset or any emotion about an event that happens halfway across the world. And I do wonder what, what it looks like when you um, actually start to uh, take deep consideration to the events and policies, politics, and it's, and it's theoretical world that happen in your immediate environment. Okay, thank you. And um, with that, why don't we uh, uh, switch to uh, uh, David Akramanis's uh, talk at this point and, uh, and appreciate the connections between the talks that, that you've introduced that. And uh, David, um, if you want to hook up your screen share um, from here, uh, it should be available. 
And let's see, in terms of, let's see, I, I introduced uh, uh, Zad's talk first. Um, so with David's, let me just say uh, a couple of words about uh, David's work with uh, the brand stack. Um, so David Ackermanis was uh, uh, also had had done uh, earlier work in an independent study that led to the formulation of, of this work. So he had a, a really good on-ramp for uh, the major research project um, ar around the brand stack. And this is developed around uh, a, a number of ideas that started really with a synthesis map in, in my systemic design course where teams pick um, a, a complex um, uh, social system problem area and describe it as a visual narrative with um, to dis to portray its inherent complexity, and and uh, David actually explored a, a lot of the ideas in that synthesis map that Zad has 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 actually worked out more in strategic communications. They investigated uh, uh, biases and framing in media presentation and in particular in social media and looking at. You know, discourses in Reddit, for example, and how how um, how people could create better arguments or the problem with thinking through even how arguments were made. And they portrayed kind of the, the complexity of, of these media constructs. And so this eventually led to to work in major research project, which I see it all as kind of connecting through this inquiry into complexity in the different domains that David's working in, also in strategic communications and advertising industry that, that Zad has also worked in successfully as well. So I don't know what applications the brand stack has yet. It's still very new, really rolled out with a major research um, uh, effort uh, completing this summer. But most of you might, yeah, I'm sure David will describe this part, but may already be familiar, somewhat familiar with the term stack, particularly if you work in um, software development, um, startups, or technology, where a stack is your preferred set of, of, uh, of uh, so, uh, software platforms and development resources that, you know, from the lowest level is considered to the highest level of the presentation or the you know, presentation layers. It's a, a stack of layers and of tools that are appropriate for building all the layers necessary for a product or service even. And so this is a novel application of the term and it starts to make real sense once you see how he's using it here. So uh, David, I'll give you, um, how about a, a 20 minute warning, another uh, uh, 10 minutes or so from there, another 10 minutes for discussion after that. Sounds good. Uh, and is my, my screen displaying correctly? Uh, I think it is, is it a PDF or, or it's Google Slides? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's Google, then it is, yes. Awesome. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, thanks for inviting me to, to share this today. Um, it's kind of the first opportunity to talk about this outside of the defense process. So I'm, um, yeah, just super jazzed. Um, so with the brand stack, um, really the MRP was about exploring how organizations can better diagnose and address systemic misalignments um, that are preventing them from achieving brand related outcomes. And so uh, with this project, I'm really asking whether if you think about your brand as a system um, rather than a trademark or a set of visual marks, um, whether that will help serve a cybernetic role and whether that would be something that would um, help manage management inside of an organization uh, more deliberately pursue um, the outcomes associated with their brand um, and the benefits associated with the concept called brand orientation that I'll, that I'll go into as I go through the presentation. So uh, today I'll talk a little bit about the concept and where it's coming from. Um, I'll, I'll briefly describe the research process and then um, talk about what I learned along the way. So uh, to kick things off, uh, what is the brand stack and what problem um, does it solve? Um, as Peter mentioned, this concept's really inspired by how cloud architects design technology stacks that promote alignment and desired outcomes within hard technical systems. And they do that by looking at components like client and server-side programming languages or hardware or software. 
Um, and this language has uh, made its way sort of out of the techie space and into the marketing space where um, marketers are now uh, assembling and designing marketing stacks. And so they're taking um, suites of tools and they're automating or better man uh, managing uh, marketing processes uh, to make the marketing function more efficient. And so given the general level of awareness, um, I thought they provided a good starting point to encourage holistic thinkings about, about brands and brand management. So with this project, I asked, you know, if you can use this type of thinking for hard systems, you know, why not soft social systems? And so my hypothesis was really that um, if we were able to encourage people in organizations to think this way, that um, people who are responsible for brand outcomes, like the chief marketing officer, uh, that those people could benefit from the integrated nature of systems-based approaches. Uh, and that really we should be thinking about brands as systems, again, not trademarks and assets that the organization owns. So the brand stack tries to um, uncover this idea um, that brand outcomes are dependent upon an interconnected set of organizational departments or subsystems, even though only one of them, the marketing department, might be formally responsible uh, for brand strategy. So this is something that happens very informally today in marketing organizations. If you talk to marketers, most of them will say, yes, it's very intuitive that brands are about more than just what happens in the marketing department, but what you won't see is a lot of organizations uh, taking great care to design themselves around their brand outcomes. They sort of uh, stumble there or, or politic their way um, to those outcomes. So um, the kind of idea for this was really born out of uh, professional frustration. Um, you know, I've worked in, mar in, in marketing and advertising and consulting and public relations now for over a decade. Um, and I've been involved in a lot of projects that were initially framed as communications problems. But What's been common to a lot of those projects um, is a more material business problem that isn't being addressed by a communications brief um, given to an agency. So um, fast moving consumer goods companies, for example, really struggled with this during the early days of social media. Um, consumers all of a sudden were given a voice and they were using that voice to share information with one another about things like the safety of product ingredients. And those conversations would often lead to reputational issues that had negative impacts on, on product sales. Uh, and so brands would often attempt to counter these issues with ads or messaging that sought to explain uh, ingredient safety. Um, but the net effect of many of these communications campaigns, uh, more often than not, was a worsening of public, uh, public perception. And if you sort of look at this um, topic as a whole, it generally wasn't until um, fast moving consumer goods companies began to change the composition of their products themselves, that consumer sentiment began to shift and sales stopped declining. So uh, Johnson's baby, um, baby powder, a prime example of this, uh, this that went through a huge scare over um, formaldehyde and ingredients that, that uh, were, were thought to cause cancer huge, huge public relations campaigns ensued, um, and it did the opposite of what they wanted it to do. Another common challenge um, that's driving this thinking is just a general lack of congruence between how brands outwardly communicate uh, and their business models. Um, and the example that I would reach for would be the brand positionings of financial institutions, which are really rife with, with contradiction. I mean, think about Scotiabank, for example, and their tagline for much of the 2000s being, you're richer than you think. Um, it, it really actually runs counter to their business model since their business is built upon encouraging uh, consumers and retail bankers to take on more debt so that Scotiabank and its shareholders can make a profit. So there's a, there's a, lack, of, a lack of congruence there. And if you look at the research about this campaign, you'll find that the tagline results in a high degree of recall among customers. So all the market research that marketers are using and the measures they're, they're, they're looking to um, measure campaign success, say this campaign is successful, but when you dig in a bit more qualitatively, there's actually massive, uh, massive impact on Scotiabank's reputation. There are memes being generated online. Um, and certainly, um, you know, Scotiabank is an institution that a lot of people would tell you they uh, would place a high degree of trust in. 
And so those gaps between how an organization acts and communicates present um, significant material risk. Um, and um, there's a fair bit of research to substantiate this. Uh, one of my favorites being the Edelman Trust Barometer, which is an annual study that um, looks at um, that looks at trust. And um, some key findings from that study would be that, um, you know, for example, trust is second only to price when it comes to attributes that influence purchase and customer loyalty. And then that same study. Um, the 2020 study in this case uh, provides multiple examples of how incongruences between actions and communication erode trust. So uh, in this year's study, uh, they found that 63% of respondents expect brands to follow up statements of racial equality with concrete action and would otherwise see those brands as exploitative or opportunistic if their words uh, didn't match their actions. So congruence really matters and it has a material impact on reputation and trust. Um, Although I've, I've sort of established this already, the actions of a lot of organizations fail to live up to the promises that are made for brand communications. And rather than trying to solve material challenges or create that congruence, um, you know, you see a lot of organizations using communications as a band-aid solution instead of addressing problems head on or trying to design themselves in such a way that um, they uh, erase those problems. So the brand stock is really grounded in these challenges um, and the desire to encourage business leaders to think more holistically about their brands as systems that influence and are congruent with the way they conduct business, not taglines, logos, um, and visual communication systems. And so when you look at uh, the literature, and I, I did a literature review um, that got into systems and got into strategic management and strategic brand management, there's some evidence that suggests that there are tangible benefits to making brand a central managerial pursuit um, and pursuing the kind of congruence that I'm talking about. So there's this concept called brand orientation, um, which is defined as a deliberate approach to brand building, where brand equity is created through interaction between internal and external stakeholders, and where brand management is perceived as a core competence, uh, and where brand building is intimately associated with organizational development and superior performance. Um, just as like a shortcut, just consider making brand sort of a, a strategic focal point in your organization. Um, there, are, there are real benefits to this approach, um, which, um, which I'll get into as we dig, dig in further. Sorry, I'm just trying to speed things along a little bit. So um, as we hear in the slides that follow, the brand stack through its promotion of brand system equilibrium and concern with the alignment of organizational resources is meant to be a tool to systematically promote brand orientation. Uh, and this uh, addresses a known gap in the literature uh, surrounding brand orientation. Um, today, although there's broad agreement and a degree of consensus around the concept itself and its importance, um, there's a lack of empirical evidence about how organizations try to become brand oriented um, and the problems they actually encounter in attempting to achieve this. So lots of people are pointing to this and say it's saying that it's important, but um, there's not a singular path to get there. So um, the project I'll start with this research question, can a brand system serve a cybernetic role helping management to diagnose and address systemic barriers to organizational alignment and brand activity, uh, brand identity, sorry. Um, this was a, an MRP that sort of started before COVID and continued into the COVID period. So initially I had planned to do a number of workshops to actually test this concept uh, in organizations, but um, because that became a bit difficult, I wasn't able to do that. So um, most of the research here is done through expert interviews. Uh, and then there was a research through design approach where uh, I went through sort of an iterative critique and co-design process with a number of um, practicing marketers to develop this concept. Um, so none of this has been tested in the field yet. As Peter said, it is rather new. Um, but I, I really do want to uh, study it further through field study in the future. So during the early stages of exploration, um, expert interviews were conducted with practicing brand strategists, consultants, and marketers. And the purpose of those interviews was really twofold. First, to find a, a little bit more about the compositions of the organizations that they're working in uh, or specific client organizations. And second, to get their feedback 
uh, on an early iteration of the brand stack. And so, um, you know, here I was really looking to understand how different organizations were thinking about the concept of brand. Um, and then as the concept developed, I was working with them to understand how this idea could be used in practice or commercialized. And then when I got into the second part of my research process and moved on from, from um, expert interviews, um, I got into a research through design um, process um, and um, a super helpful kind of iterative process that I, that I really, really enjoyed working on with people. Um, so the model shown on the slide here is by Anne-Louise Bang. And in it, hypothesizing is seen as an ongoing process that's framed by the overall research motivation. And that's really how, um, how this, this project came to life. So the intent of the project remained consistent throughout the journey of the project, but through working sessions and design critiques, um, the model changed, the question uh, evolved a little bit, um, and, and things um, kind of developed gradually. So let's walk through a couple of artifacts and iterations of the brand stack um, that were developed through that process. Um, in developing this, I used the viable system model as my starting point. Um, the assumption being that the brand stack should be a reflection of some sort of ideal state uh, in the organization. Uh, and then it should guide you towards a self-sustaining system uh, with a clear brand oriented purpose. So the idea would be here that if you have a clear purpose, you can design a viable system and that can help you um, become a more brand oriented organization. So one of the first things I did was to look at a real world organization that I felt was a good uh, example of a successful brand oriented organization. And I started by looking at REI Co-op, uh, which seemed like an ideal candidate um, given how closely wound together their business model and brand promise are. Um, if you aren't familiar with REI, uh, they're an outdoor retailer that sells sporting goods, camping gear, things like that. And uh, they employ a cooperative business model. Uh, meaning that it's owned by its active members who pay um, a membership um, on an annual basis. Um, and then each active member is entitled to vote for members of the company's board of directors and are eligible to receive dividends um, through their membership. And so um, I began the process by thinking about REI's brand system using the viable system model as inspiration. And I used their we exist to statement uh, as sort of the anchoring point for the purpose of their brand system. That statement being um, that they exist to awaken a lifelong love of the outdoors for all. Uh, and I use that to, to frame things up. So this was really the starting point of trying to imagine what the brand stack looked like. Um, if you're familiar with the VSM, uh, it'll look familiar to you. It's uh, simplified and perhaps not as confusing as, as Stafford Beer's schematic. Um, but it uses the language of the viable system model and some of the, the thinking of, of the schema. And so this was a helpful starting point because it grounded the model within the literature I explored during my lit review, um, but also because it focused on value exchanges, which I thought made it a useful diagnostic tool. Um, as I got into discussions with practicing marketers about this, a lot of people um, obviously found the model overly complicated. Uh, I think it took me like two years myself to understand the VSM. Um, and I found that people really struggled with the language of systems. So some of the feedback was like, I don't know where to look and I don't know what these things mean. Um, but you know, as someone who is familiar with systems, I found it useful to unpack the different elements of REI's business model and to understand how they interrelated to uh, advance their, their purpose of awakening a lifelong love of the outdoors for all. And I won't go through it um, you know, in, in detail, but for example, um, within the system two coordination layer, uh, when I was looking at the composition of their management team, they have, um, brand and customer oriented functions that are coordinated across the enterprise by a vice president who sits in their management team, uh, who plays that coordinating role. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just really cool to like pick apart piece by piece of the organization and understand how it contributed to this purpose and how they all worked together. Um, so moving on from there, um, I really wanted to try to find a way to simplify um, what this looked like. And so through critique and co-design, co uh, I developed a simplified hierarchical model 
Um, and this model looked to integrate language that moved away from the VSM. Um, and it looked to organize subsystems into something that was a bit easier to look at. Um, as I was working through this with, uh, with practicing marketers, people generally found it more accessible and straightforward, but it prompted a, a number of questions about the appropriate order of subsystems um, and the, the hierarchy of, of subsystems. Uh, and it also didn't really visually support an examination of value exchanges in the same way that the VSM schematic did. Um, so the evolution continued. Uh, lots of sketching, lots of uh, Zoom calls to sort of evolve things, uh, and also more tweaking of the language as well. Uh, and eventually, I arrived at a, at a uh, final-ish concept <laughs> that uh, was what's included in my MRP. So let's get into it. Um, so as I mentioned before, everything is anchored in the subsystems of the VSM, but uh, I presented them using language that's more familiar to marketers. Um, but by grounding it in the VSM, we're able to use it as a framework to help us examine the viability of a brand system and to understand if that brand system is being helped or hindered um, by the components of an organization and the way that an organization operates or is structured. And so if a brand stack is complete, the brand system is therefore not viable, and what you see is brand-related outcomes are potentially being hindered. Uh, and that opens the door for change-oriented conversations um, that can be directed based on you know, where there are incongruences or barriers. So the five subsystems um, correspond fairly loosely to the VSM. Um, you know, at uh, the system five level, you have the business model. Uh, and that's artifacts that formalize how the organization creates, captures, and delivers value. At the system four level, you have brand intelligence. Those are processes that support the gathering of intelligence so a brand can chart its course. Those are things like research functions, innovation functions, et cetera. At the system three level, you have brand expression, and these are artifacts that promote stakeholder internalization of the goals and strategies of the brand system. So those are your organizational statements like vision, mission, and purpose, uh, communications campaigns, and tailored communications. At the system two level, control systems. So these are things that are <clears throat> coordinating, harmonizing, or aligning resources, or that are rendering the brand expression uh, act actionable and practical uh, at the working level. And then you have your delivery channels. So these are uh, processes that are delivering customer and stakeholder oriented value. If you think about the value chain of an organization um, in one of those schematics that the management consultant would use, um, a lot of those components are reflected here. And then um, here is how they're oriented visually to understand how they all work together. So where I netted out with, uh, with this model, um, was to really try and organize the subsystems um, in a way that places emphasis on the focus of this concept or the intent of this concept, which is about encouraging coherence between brand expression and the actual practices of an organization. So you have uh, brand expression uh, represented on the right-hand side uh, in, the, in the dotted box that says software. And then you have the uh, actual practices of an organization in the left in the one that's labeled hardware. Um, the stack also acknowledges the importance of external and internal stakeholders in the co-creation and mediation of brand meeting. And so they've been placed at the center of the stack, acknowledging that they have a vital role in bringing the brand to life, or they're the ones who are interpreting signals about the brand, um, and therefore, you know, mediating its meaning. Um, and then I've placed control systems around the periphery. Uh, and those are connected to all the subsystems, acknowledging the importance of processes whose function is related to coordination and integration. And so these control systems support the system's ability to learn by doing, and they continually adapt the brand system based on external feedback and system performance. Uh, and then finally, I've avoided organizing components hierarchically, acknowledging that each of these subsystems is really part of a complex whole. So, this schematic tries to um, you know, bring a marketer into a place where they're understanding how all these components and pieces uh, work together. But um, like the VSM, the practical value of this is really realized when you use it to examine value exchanges between those subsystems. Um, and so 
one of the things I did was to develop this um, diagnostic tool to, to qualitatively assess value exchanges between subsystems and to prompt discussions uh, in an effort to promote brand orientation. Um, so this canvas is loosely based on uh, Nancy Bakken's canvas for mapping sustainable business thinking. Um, and I've just adapted it to make it, to make it more about um, you know, the value exchanges in, in a brand system. So how you would use this, um, you know, you're either a facilitator or a researcher and uh, you're using this in a, in a workshop setting or as part of your work process. And so the first step is to input the purpose of the brand system. And as I, as I sort of alluded to already, this can be drawn from organizational statements like mission, vision and values, those kinds of things. Um, and that's really a key step here. Care needs to be taken to ensure the right system purpose is selected, since this informs all the steps that follow. Uh, and then using the, the three lines of questioning here, each subsystem can be um, analyzed to examine whether it positively or negatively contributes to the organization's brand stack. Um, so you're looking at whether they're creating system value or destroying system value. And also with the, with the brand stack schematic in, in mind from the previous slide, are those value exchanges between subsystems flowing optimally or suboptimally? Are there blockages of some kind? Uh, and really you use this canvas to identify um, opportunities for change inside of an organization to optimize the brand system. So uh, I'll quickly close out with a, with a couple, couple uh, pieces of feedback and learning that I received along the, along the way. Um, I'd say overall with the project, I did find that this as a model can serve a cybernetic role, um, specifically for those, those who already believe in the importance of brands and see them as valuable organizational resources. Um, there's definitely some kinds of organizations that a tool like this makes sense for, and then there are market-oriented organizations like a car company or a bank that it doesn't necessarily make uh, sense for. Uh, and that's, that's really key to one of the first pieces of feedback I got, which was just that this is kind of like strategic overreach for, for a brand. Um, you know, that there are other tools that exist that promote organizational alignment of, of this kind, and, and wh why should it be a brand that um, plays this, this central role? Um, and so really the, the resolution there, or the thinking moving forward, is that this makes sense for a brand-oriented organization, but not necessarily a market-oriented one. Sorry about the sirens in the background. Um, one piece of feedback I got about this was, was that it was just an irrelevant concept. Um, and some have pointed to examples of organizations that have strong brands, but still suffer from alignment and reputational challenges. Uh, and one of the examples that gets brought up over and over again is Nike, uh, which is the world's most valuable apparel brand. They have a market capitalization of over 34 billion, um, but they're well known for you know, issues around labor practices dating back to the 90s. Um, and attention continues to be drawn to those practices through its supply chain. And so those who point to, uh, there are those who point to reputational issues such as these and say, well, you know, the kind of alignment you're talking about here simply doesn't matter. Um, and for them, the symbolic power of the brand and its perceived values in the eyes of the consumer matters more than any, any sort of internal alignment um, that, I'm, that I'm talking about. And I think that's an objection that, you know, merits some further consideration. Um, but I think the Nike example also provides a compelling counterpoint. When you look at Nike's mission, which is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world, um, their website goes on to note, you know, if you have a body, you are an athlete. And I would argue that forced labor arguably runs counter to this mission. Um, a human being or athlete is not going to be inspired if their human rights are being violated. Um, but one of the things I think that's interesting here is that there's a lack of proximity between the customers who co-create the brand's meaning, Nike's mission, and the claims about labor conditions within its supply chain. And so, um, say for example, um, another brand was in this situation, the Tom's brand, which um, you know, was well known for creating one-for-one -one products that serve um, you know, a, a social purpose. Um, they're in, they're in, um, they're in uh, business to improve lives, according to their, um, their website. And so if they were, for example, accused of the same misdeeds, uh, the market reaction would probably be pretty different. So there's something interesting there around proximity that this model hasn't necessarily um, taken into account yet. Um, and then, yeah, I mentioned this already, but um, just 
you know, appropriateness. Um, the brand stock may be more appropriate for some organizations, not for others. Um, the research really pointed towards charities and governmental organizations that are inherently mission or purpose driven as great candidates for, for this kind of uh, thinking. Um, but also single brand organizations that, that are brand oriented. So a brand like Lululemon, for example, that um, you know, lists its ability to maintain the value and reputation of its brand as the biggest risk factor within its annual report and are well known for being a very brand oriented organization. Uh, finally, ease of commercialization. Um, this is something I'm, I'm continuing to think about. So just, you know, is there a market fit for a concept like this? Um, the desire with this tool is really to use it as a consulting tool um, with, uh, with marketers. And uh, there are definitely opportunities for future study. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is understand sort of the landscape of brand systems and whether there are um, different archetypes of brand stacks that exist in the world um, that can maybe be used as uh, heuristics to bring people into this concept a bit more easy, um, a bit more easily. Um, certainly there's gonna be a lot of barriers to real world implementation that I want to explore through field, uh, field work. Um, same goes for the brand stack and diagnostic canvas as a whole um, and then getting into the measurable um, outcomes associated with the implementation of a tool like this, does it actually result in, in brand orientation? Uh, and does that translate into material effects for the organization, uh, such as increased performance or, or integration? And thanks, I know that was pretty fast and curious. Thank you, David. Yeah, um, let's uh, open it up to questions that, uh, that you might have. Let me, um, I have a couple of course, but uh, let me open it up first for, he's got a burning question for, for David on, on, uh, on the presentation, on any of the ideas, possible applications. Manpreet here, uh, Peter and David. Hi. Hi, I think the presentation was really interesting and I could relate because right now I'm working uh, for a branding and design agency in Toronto. Um, I, what I struggle from uh, my education at SFI and working with brands is like mostly the human centered aspect is only used to exploit users, like learn from them and use it to abuse more. And all the research are like almost like pointed towards how can you extract more? And that's where I feel like the conversation of values or sustainability or the way the, you know, the strongly sustainable business model talks about what are your not only financial uh, assets, but what are your bio stocks or your human stock, uh, stocks, right? So I mean, in this system, I am just trying to see where is the place for that? Is there in some, like, I'm sure it was a very short time, so maybe you would have thought about it, but that's what I was wondering. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it's sort of a two part question, like where, where, is the, where is the value component and how does it take into account also um, some of the things that the strongly sustainable business model does from a, uh, an environmental perspective? Is that yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the model as it's constructed right now, um, I mean, certainly you, you can put a very values oriented or, or socially oriented purpose at the center of, of the model. And I think it, it starts to, to get at some of that, but I think mm -hmm. you've brought up a fair critique in that, um, it doesn't necessarily think about bio stocks or environmental components, um, at least, you know, actively or, or overtly. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you. But I think it's a really thorough research. Some of the things were very new to me also, but it was very well done. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Elena, did you have a follow up to your point about the translation? of the VSM, in particular of the, you know, the... the uh, well, I just uh, thought that for a brand that the uh, homeostat between the present and the future was really a uh, key to dealing with that. 
and the role of the system five as being an identity and coherence function as monitoring that to make sure that neither one goes too far off the rails. Uh, so I think that that, you know, that's kind of an important aspect. And I also thought it was important to keep the audit aspect of system three star because that is supposed to mop up the variety. And if something happens like uh, the talcum powder uh, that was seen to be uh, tainted, uh, being able to quickly go through and when a new regulation happened or a new, uh, a new risk was identified and do a quick audit and say, where are we vulnerable here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think you're bang on. Um, the one thing I would say, you know, throughout the development process of this, um, I, I really struggled to bring marketers into into the systems world. Um, for you know, for most of the people who I was working with to develop the concept, the language isn't familiar to them, and and um, anytime I would try to bring people into the world of the VSM, um, there was a huge um cognitive overhead that i would have to deal with and and so because i had limited time with a lot of the participants i was trying to you know sort of reduce or simplify the concept um which definitely you know does it a disservice um so yeah absolutely a fair point well one uh one thing that i found helped although i would say it was mostly working with people that had at least one foot in the systems field uh, is uh, to give people a case study and then, uh, you know, tape on the floor or, or uh, have a, uh, 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 a template uh, shown on the floor from a, a light up, up at the top and give people a role in one of the systems and say, okay, you know, how would, what would your function here in this system be to address this issue? and basically uh, run a, about an hour play shop. And I found that people actually seemed to get it quite easily when, uh, when they got to basically uh, go through it and enact mm -hmm. it. Essentially, it, it makes it a performance. Yeah, I can definitely see that, that being helpful. I mean, when I, when I started on this journey, one of the things I really wanted to do was to take this and go into organizations and, and actually sit down with teams and work with them and um, not to do exactly what you've described, but to help people find themselves in, in this model um, and to have, have conversations about how they were interacting with one another um, you know, through this model. Um, so yeah, I can see how once you've situated yourself in it, it becomes a lot easier to access because it's, it's pretty conceptual um, when you kind of are exposed to it for the first time. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that works with that is that uh, you can give them a relatively simple case study as their, as their performance uh, direction. And you avoid getting into all of the nuances of their own situation. Yeah. I I think one of the things that happened in uh, David's uh, research as well as uh, Zod's is the reduction of face-to-face -face, uh, or the ability to do any face-to-face -face work. So the original, so it didn't get it really a chance to workshop it yet in terms of an application or to create, uh, you know, to test out the method. And so it had to be done more of these remote discussions, which um, still worked well uh, for a methodology that was, that was pushing it's called research through design. And so the research is done through this artifact, you know, through the artifact of the brand stack and evaluating that kind of as a getting feedback through evaluation, iterating on that concept as you saw the different iterations um, in the presentation. But, yeah, I... but not getting to actually to the point yet where you could workshop it because of all the restrictions around COVID and the yeah, limited. The restrictions have, have yeah. been a big problem for a lot of things. But that's a really good idea to actually turn it into, you say, as a play shop where it could actually physically kind of communicate between the between the, the different system domains in a VSM without actually using VSM language to have 
people act out through their roles. And uh, you could do that with really anyone in the team that could LARP in a way to act out uh, the different <laughs> system uh, being basically told what your role would be, where you would be in the organization, and how you might interact with the brand um, and let them, and then give them, um, uh, you know, a, a um, kind of story problem to work through that, that they could use in that. Um, well, uh, I learned about it from a fellow called Larry DeBevoort, who uh, worked in West Virginia with factories and literally used, rented a football field and limed out the VSM on the whole football field and gave people t-shirts with their roles. And most of these people didn't have more than a high school education. Well, uh, was that with like the DuPont um, factories or the chemical? Uh... No, it wasn't DuPont. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know. That was another bunch of systems people. Yeah, because, you know, Dick Knowles in, in the cyber yeah. ASC, yeah, he was a DuPont. He used the Enneagram in a similar, a similar way with uh, performance improvement in those DuPont companies. So it's it's interesting, and so this is a similar type of translation, I guess, David, where where other systems thinkers have actually translated some very complex models into into performance improvements by doing the translation work in this in kind of taking it right down to the level of the application in that environment. But there's also there's a couple things I wanted to ask or mention here to have you reflect on, David, one is that didn't come up really, I mean, it might have come up in the dis in, in our discussions, but not, not in a way that might um, be used to like an application. So one is this kind of big question of really what is an organization, you know, from, a, from the different systems models that define organizations. Um, like as uh, Fernando Flores's um, view of the organization as a network of conversations also similar to you know uh, and that's based on on his approach to uh, it's not exactly gordon pask's conversation theory it's ontological design but conversation theory is also another view of organization as a as a network of relationships and conversations that enable them but when organizations have a very strong brand you know they're some of the kind of <clears throat> the uh, other system models of organization like uh, structure and agency structuration um, don't may not matter as much as what is the organization can the organization be defined by its um, by its identification with a brand and that doesn't happen overnight so maybe one of the one of the things is how do, how does an organization get to be a Nike or an Apple over time where the brand is under 